Hello and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Mic, the podcast's playbook. Today we are chatting all things production. Well, actually not all things. We're just starting with how you can equip your podcast because there's actually just way too much for us to chit chat about on all the things of production. So today we're going to be chatting through microphones, interfaces, cameras and lighting. Cool. So let's get straight into it. We're back with... Nicholas and Bradley, our podcasting experts. Cool. So talking microphones, I think we'd all argue that audio quality is the most essential aspect of one's podcast and everything else built around it really just are additives. Mm. So if we're talking audio quality, Bradley, can you chat us through... Um, some industry standards in terms of microphones cool so i mean yes i think audio quality is the most important thing if you're gonna spend on gear spend on audio first um purely because you can yeah like you can't hide from bad audio um whereas video as long as it kind of shows what's going on you can get away with varying degrees of quality um Mm. Especially when you're starting out. But I think audio is where your energy is best spent. Um, In terms of industry standards at the top of the line, um, for me in podcasting, there's two microphones. Uh, This being one of them, the Rode Procaster. Um, Yeah, incredible microphone uh, built from a uh, kind of DNA of a radio broadcast microphone. Um. I think that's the the one, and then the other is the Shure SM7B. Um, the Shure SM7B is a very identifiable microphone. It's that one that looks like a big black rocket ship. Um, and yeah, the Shure SM7B isn't as specifically for podcasting as the Procaster is. The SM7B is used universally across studios for music for a variety of different things. Um, yeah vocals but also other instruments kick drums you can put them on basically everything very they have varying polar patterns uh, and different modes that you can switch in hardware on the actual microphone itself which the procaster doesn't have uh, which is what makes the sm7b a more kind of universally useful microphone but for podcasting two top of the line for me are, are those two the procaster and the sm7b okay got you and here in our free ebook the kaya guide to podcasting which you should definitely download uh we've also listed some alternative options being the road pod mic the sure mv7x the sure sm58 and the road podcaster so nick what i want to chat through with you is obviously we've listed our two preferences what is it about those mics and these alternatives that people should be looking for when they're looking for a podcast mic? Because mics do different things. What is it that you're wanting to capture? What is it that you're not wanting to capture with the mic? Yeah, well, I think the first thing you should take into consideration is what you're going to be using it for. So, yeah, we're in a studio and these guys are very nice. In a studio, um, it doesn't capture a lot of um like surrounding noises it's very directional you have to be very close to it in order for it to really like pick up um sound like the sound yeah Um, like the difference being this to this yeah like it's It's significant yeah um whereas um the road Wireless the wireless goes, goes. The wireless goes would you like to show the people badly so this is a good show and tell moment uh so one before we get to this one, the pod mic, which is the kind of little sibling of the Rode Procaster, is also a, a really good and I think a really good starting podcast microphone. For me, it's got a slightly higher noise floor, which is the level of noise you can hear. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't have quite the same presence as the Procaster. And uh, by that, you're talking about the richness of somebody's voice. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Um it's a drastic oversimplification of the differences, but for sure, you know, um, at a basic level. Uh, another, yeah, the for me the goat microphone that you can just use for everything, and it's great on podcasts. It's great on literally everything in the world. The iconic Shure SM57. It is microphone. <laughs> oh yeah, that's actually way better. <laughs> um, 
yeah, it's the most iconic microphone on the planet, and it's just very, very good on vocals, so you can definitely use it uh, as a podcast mic. They're very, very affordable, and for what they are worth, uh, priceless. Um, Nick uh, was a, was mentioning the Rode Wireless Goes, mm. and I'll let you get into the differences and why you brought it up there. Um, these are a really cool little offering, um, also from Rode. They've got new versions. There's the Wireless Pros now, I think. Are the Wireless Pros the ones with the like floof on top? No, it's just a new version of this. They all have floof on okay, top. Okay, so you can all they can all have the floof on top. <laughs> yes. So if you just wanted to deck your mic out with floof, <laughs> like the, f- <laughs> the floof Gene is referring to, <laughs> is otherwise referred to as like a windshield. Um, or a or a bunny tail or a whatever you want to call it, um, and yes, these little road wireless goes do have little attachment bunny tails. I don't actually have one right here, mm. um, but the wireless go and the wireless go two, which is what we have, um, are these very very cool little microphones. They come in a set with a, a receiver that receives from both microphones, which are transmitters. They transmit wirelessly. Blah, 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 blah. They're incredible. They, um, and you could kind of see on the front if I show it here, um, the microphone capsule itself is this little silver thing. And it is a very broad pickup pattern in uh, contrast to something like this where there's very directional. Um, and they can get into that there. Uh, what's cool with these is you can use them in a couple of different ways on podcasts. Uh, one being if you want to put them on a stand, you can buy the interview handle uh, attachment, which is literally just a clip for it. And it comes with a nice little uh, pop filter. So you can put that on a stand and have someone talk into it like a normal mic. Uh, they also come, you can buy a Lavalier microphone attachment lavalier microphone being these tiny little wired ones that you would clip onto a shirt um so that's if people are like going to move around they don't want to be restricted to a stand um Got and they you. want it to be more subtle that's a really good option and is the the audio quality with that little wireless one coming from the actual microphone input or is it in the body of the so with nothing plugged in, it's just the body itself. So you can run it just as that, and you can put them anywhere. You can attach them to top of cameras. That you know, it's universally quite yes. useful. If you plug in the Lavalier, or you can plug in any other microphone with a three point five mm jack. Mm. So you can also use like shotgun microphones, um, and use that as a wireless transmitter. If there's anything plugged in, it takes from that. So you can also use them just as a transmitter with really, really good uh, mics with a three point five mil jack. Okay. Thank you for the show and tell moment, Bradley. Nick, do you want to touch on what you're going to say about sort of the qualities of these mics, what they can and shouldn't be used for? Yeah, so like, like what I was saying, these mics over here, they're very good for ha- being in this sort of environment in a studio, whereas the wireless cos, they are very much more equipped for being sort of like being on a running gun sort of this type of shoot mm-hmm. where you're going to be moving a lot um, like if if you're at a rugby game or a cricket game, for example, and you're there shooting content and you're going to be talking to a lot of different people, that's very good. It's that's just because it's very light, mobile. Um, yeah, that's the sort of mic you want to be using. Um, I will say for those mics, it's much more sensitive than these. Um, you don't want to you don't want to be like directly like have your mouth right on it. You can yeah. at every TikToker using these little <laughs> wireless microphones and trying to swallow yeah. them. So I, I think mean, that's, yeah. It can be very much like your by your mm. chest and it will hear you perfectly yeah. fine. Um, the downside of that being? The downside being if you... Oh, what? It's going <laughs> to hear everything else <laughs> yeah, really gonna, well. Yeah. yeah, it picks up the room much, mm. quite much more. Um, but something you have to be careful with those guys is... You, if you like, they can clip very easily. If you shout, like, if you speak very, like, into it, mm. it's very easily. Yeah, clips. and I've done that before. I use the wireless goes a lot. Um, attach it to my lapel, and if you 
shovel here it's gonna distort the audio if you get excited it's gonna distort the audio and I know because I've done it but I thought it's really valuable for us to speak about mm. these mic options because like you said a lot of TikTokers are using it and a lot of people are using it as they're getting into their podcasting journey and I think this is just a point to you can have the right equipment and use it wrong so do your research well said man thank you <laughs> Okay, now that we've chatted through our microphone options, we're going to talk about interfaces and audio recorders. So where is that audio going to? Where is it being captured? A capture little device. So Brad, do you want to quickly run us through the different options for the varying different yeah. types of sizes of podcasts? So the first thing I want to say is all of or the SM58, the Procaster, the SM7B, the PodMic, um, uh, are all XLR microphones. They use a pro audio connector called the XLR. It's what these are plugged into. And you have to have those. Those you obviously can't plug into a computer. So they require an audio interface, which helps to amplify the signal that comes from the microphone to a usable level and converts it digitally. Cool. And you have one to yes, show the people. Yes, I do have one to show the people. But I'm going to get to that in a second. Okay. First thing being... There are also USB microphones available. Mm. Um, they're coming out more and more frequently. Uh, Blue and the Blue Yeti, the Blue Snowball are famous old options. But recently, there's a pod mic USB. There's the MV7X from Shure, which is similar to the SM7B, but a USB XLR version. Um, I think there's a new version of the Procaster that's USB as well. They're starting to roll it out more for people who don't want to have the whole shebang and just want to plug straight in. Mm. And there's those. There's a lot to be said for those options. It wouldn't be my personal preference, but that's a personal thing. When it comes to interfaces, there are different ways that one can go. Technically, the transmitter on the road uh, wireless goes can be used as an interface in terms of you can use it to take two tracks from each mic into your laptop as an audio recording thing. They record on their own. I wouldn't do it. It's a it's kind of null and void, but you can do it. Um, the next level up for me as an interface is a little two inputs interface like the Scarlett Focusrite uh, 2i2. Uh, this is an iconic interface. Half the musicians and producers in the world own uh, two i2s and what these do is they allow you to plug in xlrs you can adjust the gain you have headphone outputs and speaker outputs etc etc and these are great the only disadvantage to this is it only has two inputs you can mm. only do like a two-person podcast um bye nick <laughs> exactly <laughs> um <Poop. laughs> in terms of other options there, where you can also start looking at the portable recorders. That is an interface that has to plug into a laptop and use it to record into a digital audio workstation. Uh, if you want to do something a little bit more on the go, but also a little bit higher production value than, for example, you know, the wireless goes or Godox have versions, uh, sure have a version now of those little wireless things. Uh, if you want to do something that's still portable, but not quite as low production value, You'd look at something like the Zoom handheld recorders. Um, I think there's the there's various versions. The they have pod track versions. There's a P4, there's a P2. Um, I think there's actually a bigger one as well. Um, there's the H4N, which is a more traditional, just on the go recorder that I think you can plug XLRs into. They come in varying uh, versions of what kind of input you can plug into, but those are great for mm. if you're doing a more portable on the move podcast. Yeah. Um, once you're looking up from those, is you're looking at multiple inter like multiple input interfaces. Um, there's your traditional inter like audio interfaces a la uh, a studio, which is something like the Falk the Falkus right the Focus <laughs> right Scarlet eighteen i twenty, which is what we've got, which is the very big sibling to the two i two. It's got way more inputs. It's got eight XLRs and a bunch more outputs, and you can run custom monitor mixes for each output. Blah 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 blah. Um, and that's great for doing panel discussions for mm. four, five, six person podcasts, that kind of thing. Uh, another place one can look there, there are some Zoom pod tracks, and I think they're L6, which are also 6 XLR inputs. Um, or you can look at something like the Rodecaster Pro, the Rodecaster Pro 2. Um, they've got a two-track version as well, uh, and that's a custom-designed live podcasting mixer. It's designed for that purpose. So it's got little faders on it, it's got 
sound pads. It's got, you can get your phone, Bluetooth, um, USB. You can record directly. You don't need a laptop. All kind of, yeah, it's a all-in-one podcasting Add solution. Add some bells box. and whistles. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, and there are now more and more versions of those. Mackie also has recently made one. Um, I think there is a Zoom console version. Um, so, yeah, those are really cool as well for kind of if you're doing a one man or one production person that's also a host situation. Yes. Okay. And again, I think it's great chatting about these different options because there's no one size fits all for mm. podcasting and you don't need to invest in gear that you don't necessarily need or need yet. So make sure to do your research on specific your specific type of equipment. Mm. Um, moving swiftly along into the popular age of video podcasts. So we're going to chat through cameras. And if you want to capture your conversation um, visually, how you can do that. So Nick, I'm going to hand over to you to tell us a little bit about um, how one can do that. But like, let's start simple. Let's say someone just has an iPhone. Yes. So, I mean, the iPhone, you can definitely do it with an iPhone. Um, the the limitations you have with an art with shooting with any phone really is just storage battery and overheating mm. um yeah those are like the big problems like you don't want to be busy with a recording and then your phone runs out of storage and then oh the whole podcast you got to stop yeah. it blah, blah, blah. Yeah. um and if you're using the front camera you might not even know <laughs> you might not it's a very know. real thing yes. <laughs> yeah been there, done there. And <laughs> been there, done there. Been nice. there, done that. Thank you. <laughs> and also be preferable to be using the, not the front camera. You mean the yeah, back, back camera. camera. You meant the back yes, camera. Yes, I did mean the back camera. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we worked it out. And the great thing is a lot of phones actually have like the ability to film in 4K yeah, yeah. quality. Um, yeah. The great thing about iPhone is that it gives you the ability to film in 4K. Um, the problem is with shooting full f shooting in, in 4K is that it takes up extremely a lot of like um, storage. So like an hour of 4K footage is like 50 gigs. Yeah. Well, probably more than 50 gigs actually of, of storage space. Yeah. Um, so maybe somebody doing like a bite-sized mm. podcast or maybe you didn't want your podcast yeah. to be bite-sized, but you have a great iPhone with not a lot of storage. Adapt and conquer people. Yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah, you can still do a lot of the, like, cropping mm. in. You can get full HD reels, all of that. So from, like, a technical perspective, you can do most of the, ba like, most of the things right. You lack, like, control of aperture and lighting and things yeah. like that, which are, like, things to mm. add, and they add value, but especially in the beginning, yeah. it's... And you might be tempted to use your front-facing camera so you can see yourself recording, but you're literally just chipping away at whatever quality you have, use the back camera. It says it's 4K, mm, but it's different. Yeah, <laughs> maybe set up a little mirror so you can see it because Nick was mentioning earlier that, yeah, your recording can stop um, without you knowing, and that's also a big issue. Okay, but let's say we're moving up in life from our 4K camera to something like a DSLR. Um, what are the pros and cons there? Yeah, so the DL DSLR is... A much better option you can it has um sd slots so you can put in a, a sd and and then that's much better because now you are much safer when it comes to storage space mm. um also you uh can plug power right into this dslrs you can uh well, some most of them, of them some yeah of them. not all of you them can buy attachments and handles and yeah yes um but that's that's a plus yeah. okay um, then and then obviously you have much more control over your iso aperture frame well yeah you can change frame rates on a phone but yes um much more range uh yeah. yeah i mean the one thing with dslrs a lot of them don't shoot 4k video um mm. th you can get into a conversation about the value of like a lower resolution with a better um, you know, sensor and lens looking better than higher resolution that's badly exposed and things like that. And I think those are all fair arguments to be made. Um, For sure. And especially if the standard is full HD, which is 1080p by 920, mm. most DSLRs shoot that. Yeah. 
great. You lack the ability to crop in. You lack the ability to crop in vertical yes. on some of them. Yeah. Um, so it yeah. could be good for your wide camera if you do yeah. two kinds of cameras. Perfect. And then so, I mean, it solves a lot of the issues with storage. If it can be plugged into power, your battery issue. But often they don't film longer than around 30 minutes. Yes. In one go. Yes. Um, and so that is something to be noted. Yeah. yeah. I Strange mean, tax idiosyncrasy that if they can record over 30 minutes, they're technically a video camera. And it's something about the EU and then they w they have to charge them at a higher rate. Sounds but too complicated have, for me. <laughs> you can use a magic lantern, card, can you not? You can jailbreak <laughs> your camera. <laughs> you can jailbreak your camera with... Hot uh, this is not <laughs> officially recommended or endorsed. No t T's and C's apply. Don't do this. This is just for educational purposes only. Um, there are certain things you can download onto SD cards like a product called Magic Lantern, which allow you greater control over your camera's features, shall we say. And they kind of get around the problem by basically immediately restarting your video recording as soon as it ends which is great as a workaround, but it does mean you lose a frame mm. um, at least, which doesn't look great. But if you have multiple cameras, you can just cut between them. No one will be any the wiser. <laughs> Stunning. Okay, moving up from a DSLR into our more professional video cameras, we have 4K cameras, and Nick, John chat us through some of the features of those, yeah. like your camcorders, Canon XF 405s and whatnot. <laughs> Yeah, so camcorders is, I would say, the go-to if you for podcasts just because it's, well, it's the ideal camera to use for something to just, you set it up and forget about it, you know? Um, it, metaphorically. Metaphorically, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah um, so it has, you can plug power into it. You can, it shoots 4K. Mm. Um, most of them go up to 50 frames per yeah. second. Yeah. Um, most of them also have dual SD card slots. Dual SD card slots. So you can put two two SD cards into one camera, which is great. Most of batteries if you need them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which is, yeah. Big. Which is, yeah, it could be cool if you want to pop it on your shoulder and mm. go around. Might not be as safe to be walking <laughs> around with that kind of equipment, but it's an option. Yeah. Um, and then it's also great for uh, like um, run and gun type of shoots. You know, it, uh, it's a, a very compact body. Um, They've got the DNA of documentary filmmakers. That's, yeah. You know, that's <laughs> where they're from. I think the other thing to note with a lot of them is the ability to plug XLRs directly in, which we really like as... Yeah, for us, the like volume of podcasts we're making, the amount of time, like these don't overheat ever. Um, no matter how long you run, you can record for hours on end. Uh, you can plug SDI cables and things like that in, which is helpful as well as many HDMIs. And you can plug XLRs in, which we use as a fail safe. So mm -hmm. we're running into an interface and then running a stereo stream out into the main camera just as a as an extra level of precaution. So... From a like consistency and dependability perspective, we found them the best solution. For sure. But you know what's not great? Having a fucking 4K camera and lighting your setup with like <laughs> fucked up shit. It's going to look shit. So let's get into lighting as abruptly as yeah. that. Um, cool. Again, all your gear options for cameras, probably not going to make that much of a difference if your lighting setup um, hasn't been thought through well. So let's chat key light, full light, practical lights, hair lights, and reflectors. Let's chat through a key light. Uh, what is a key light, Nick? Uh, yeah, so basically a key light is your main source of light. Um, right now, our key light is sitting over here. That is our main I source wondered, of light. I wonder, do you have your phone? And I'll, we can insert it into the... That's a good... I've always wanted to do that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Nick, I'm your PO. <laughs> okay. So this is a key light over here. Um, that's basically the brightest light in the room. Um, that's the rule. Yeah. Um, that's what's lighting it most. And then our full light is going to act like yeah. what? So our full light is usually set up on the shadow side of the subject. And that's there just to create sort of a softer image. Mm. You don't want if you don't want harsh shadows, the full light's there to just create a little bit of a like 
yeah, just to add some light to the shadow. Yeah, so um, it's not as like harsh or exactly. It's not as yeah. dramatic. Maybe as if you. you're filming like a moody like drama, you might not want and such a, <laughs> a hectic um, full light. But for us, yeah, we're not trying we, to do that. <laughs> we want to keep it light and moody. Um, yeah, and then. Here, what is the other one? Uh, then we have practical <laughs> lights. <laughs> yeah, so practical lights are really nice. One of my favorite types of lights. Me um, too. <laughs> so basically a practical light is a light that can be seen inside the frame. Um, it's usually set up in the background. Um, and what it does is it, it's great for adding like depth to mm -hmm. the image because it uh, lights up the space in the back. Um I feel like it also contributes, often people have like um, a colorful or like a warm practical light. It adds uh, like sort of emotions and mood into mm. your frame. Yeah. I mean, into your frame, into your, your setup. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, were you going to say something? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, various people use them in different ways. It is such a good way to mm. like demonstrate the style of your content. Like the, you know, like, are you going super high tech? Do you have like lots of Lani lamps or do mm. you have like an eclectic balance of different things? Do you have fairy lights? Like all of those are practical lights. Yes. Um, are they production lights? What, yeah. you know, it can really set the tone. Yeah. And then, so we have a hair light or a backlight, which separates the object from the background. Mm. So this can also be yeah. achieved with techniques like how far you are from the camera. But yeah. Yeah. You said it. Um, it's really the purpose of, of it is to create, to separate you from the background. Um, so and the where, image isn't as flat. Yeah. And where would you like position that? Like it's obviously called a hair light and a backlight, but we don't have one here right now. I mean, this is sort of from the side, but where yeah. would one position a backlight, Nick? Um, so you can either place it like directly behind the subject so it won't be seen. So like right behind me, but or okay. you could set it like above out of camera um, and strike yeah. down on you. Or depending on if you've got a like a significant key light at an angle. So say my key light's 45 degrees or 60 degrees relative to the camera. If I put the hair light opposite that, it's going to kind of maximize the impact of it in terms of the two lights kind of going at each other across the, the subject. So yeah, it can sometimes be like not quite laterally behind relative yeah. to the camera but it's behind relative to the other light source okay cool yeah and then lastly we have a reflector which from my understanding is a piece of material that reflects light one of its objectives is to fill in shadows is another one also to soften the light sometimes or nick you correct me if i'm wrong yeah so uh, yeah, reflectors to bounce light basically um, can be used in, as you said, as a full light. Um, it also interesting way to use uh, like reflector is if you are, want to create like a slash of light maybe in frame at the back, and that can sort of be um, also just used to make the image interesting to add some depth to it. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so it can quite literally be used to reflect a key light onto a background mm. and like yeah. okay um yeah so some people even use it like as the key light so they will re reflect the key light onto a um yeah like a white a reflective white surface reflective basically. yeah and what that does is just it um bounces the light and really diffuses it diffuses, it, diffuses yeah. the mm. lights basically okay got you so there are some problems with just using your standard household lighting, um, which is why we're going to get into what kinds of lights you can look to buy to add to your lighting rig. But Brad, do you quickly want to chat us through what happens if you're using a household light um, with a frame rate that is not compatible with your recording device? Yeah, so... Sure. basics electrics of it being like uh, lights either you cycle at a rate of uh, 50 or 60 hertz uh, commercial like household lights mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think in South Africa, it's they are at 60, so we shoot in 25 so that the frame rates don't align. Yeah. Because, yeah. So basically, if you shoot at a frame rate where the shutter speed is, for example, a frame rate of 25, your shutter speed has to be one uh, fiftieth of a second. Um, and a light that is at 50 hertz is outputting lights and it's the cycle of those light of that light is also at one over 50 and so basically the shutter speed of the camera and the actual on and off cycle of the light interact and you get that banding look Mm. in your where your light source wherever your light source touches this like process of light and dark bands moving up and down your image and there is sweet bugger all you can do about it in yeah. post-production there's absolutely nothing it if will you, cock yeah. up your video if you can't picture what brad is saying just google it because you would have definitely seen it on a video before yeah, yeah. and it is just yeah m- you don't want to do that by mistake so um, as nice as it might be to add your like special lamp maybe change the bulb or like we mentioned earlier you can even adjust your frame rate settings in an iphone or yeah. Uh, a phone camera and you can definitely do so on yeah. a dslr or camcorder in most cases they've got uh there's 24 f- well yeah conventionally you have 24 frames per second which is cinema standard 25 which is kind of internet and content wow. standard well so, f- so in south africa standard yes. is 25 I- yes yeah because yeah. our yeah, because of the way our lighting yeah. is configured in other territories, the standard is 30 because of the way their lighting is configured, yeah. or it's 29.97. <laughs> so you can shoot with 60 hertz lights and not, yeah. Oh, I'm very glad I have you guys to think about all of this <laughs> for me because my brain is literally starting to hurt. But just to finish up on lighting rig, what brands would you recommend that people look at and also what types of lights should or could they invest in? throwing it out to the the field cool i mean the uh, in terms of brands i mean you're looking at godox aperture are really really good at and make some really really good lights but those are also more production um what's those big cinema lights with a u i forget the name um ah, it's fine it'll come I to don't me know. um but uh, Talifo also make really good lights uh, and at varying ranges. Um, what we've got are the Godox SL60s, um, which are really great video softbox lights, very basic 60 watt lights, not a high power draw. They're not crazy overpowered, but they're really good. Um, things like an Aperture 200D is kind of a very, very industry standard light. Um, and if someone's not investing in a softbox, what else could they use? I would suggest like you just bounce in the lights. Well, because what the purpose of the soft mm. softbox is is just to diffuse the light. Mm-hmm. That can also be achieved through bouncing lights. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you also get the ring lights or bar lights that are really really nice. Um, that kind of give you a different effect. If you had to pick two lights to start, I'd recommend a basic softbox styled set. It Mm -hmm. just gives you so much variety of option. Um, But yeah, you also get color changing lights like a a ring light, the Godox ones. Um, The SL60, I think it's called the SL60 Bi, is also a really good option. That's a bi-color white light, so you can change it from 5600 Kelvin down to, I think, about 2800 um, which is very, very warm light. So that's uh, a nice feature as well. Okay. And stunning, just like that, we have talked through all the basics of how to start equipping your podcast. Mm. Next time we'll be back still chatting about production, but how you can actually set up your space where we'll get into some more detail and stuff we have chatted about, some new stuff. So definitely stay tuned for that and ask us any questions about what we have chatted about If it wasn't clear, we're trying to be as quick and concise as possible. But if you are not an auditory learner, download our ebook, The Kaya Guide to Podcasting. Brad. (laughs) (laughs) Brad, Nick, thank you so much for chatting with me today, entertaining my silly goofiness. But let's all remember we're here to have fun, but don't buy equipment you don't need.
especially without researching it. That's not fun. That's not silly. That's just silly. Wasting money. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Gina, uh, for hosting us. Love you. Bye. Bye. -bye.